Welcome to segment 10 of our course on Catholic doctrine. What I'd like to present at this point is a discussion of the kingdom of God and the church. Um, and maybe I've already kind of given you the answer to this question, but, um, you know, I uh, would like you to think about this. If you were an all-powerful king or queen who could do whatever to change the world, what would you do? What kind of a world would you create or make or remake? Think about that. Of course, we don't have that power. We don't even have that power in our own homes a lot of times. But think about what if God, of course, God does have the power, but he allows us free will. So we're able to do our thing within his realm. However, what would the kingdom of God look like if God really became a dominant, domineering God that really took over and made us follow his will, whether we liked it or not. Um, that's our, our first topic of discussion here. The kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? Um, it's kind of a new topic of discussion for a lot of Catholics. Um, we really didn't talk about the kingdom of God too much um, in the past. We talked about heaven and hell, and we talked about the church, and you know, um, but we didn't really talk about the kingdom of God and what that was. And yet, if you look at the scriptures, the kingdom of God is really the center point, the core of Jesus' preaching. Read one of the Gospels, especially either Matthew, Mark, or Luke, what we call the synoptic gospels, read one of those gospels and you will see just the kingdom of God coming up all the time. Matter of fact, right at the beginning of Mark, Jesus announces the kingdom. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. What's he talking about here? Well, he's talking about a new vision for heaven and earth. And I just want to break this open a little bit in the first part of our discussion. But going back to Scripture, there are parables about the kingdom of God, the parable, parable of the sower, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is like. There are similes about the kingdom of God. In other words, the kingdom of God is like a pearl. There are visionary statements like, unless you become like one of these little children, you will not be, uh, not be able to enter the kingdom of heaven. And there's moral challenges. Uh, the rich shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. And the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, the kingdom of heaven is theirs. So this kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, um, what's he talking about? Because he never actually sits down or stands up, whichever, and describes exactly what this is. He seems to be throwing out a lot of hints about it. Well, it's pretty obvious that the kingdom of God is a social reality. It's some kind of new social reality that Jesus is proclaiming, not only with his words, but with his life and his death and resurrection. Uh, if we think about what happened after Adam's and Eve's sin, after the original sin, uh, it's in a sense, the kingdom of Satan was established. And uh, actually, when Jesus was tempted by Satan in the desert, Satan kind of presented him with some of the glories of his kingdom. Now, the kingdom of Satan uh, has to do with violence, oppression, uh, war, prejudice, racism, divisions. And so, really, the kingdom of God would be the opposite of that. The kingdom of God would, would be uh, replacing Satan's kingdom with God's kingdom, which would be 
a kingdom of justice and peace and love, equality, a kingdom that doesn't look at the power structures of the world and our own selfishness as the meaning of life, but that would look at solidarity and the respect for uh, humans, uh, human dignity and justice and peace as the meaning of life. Um, this really says a lot to us because in a way, I think it's a, there's a real temptation for us to look at Jesus coming and dying so that my sins would be forgiven, so that I could get into heaven. And of course, that is part of Jesus' mission. Jesus comes with forgiveness for sins. Jesus, um, it's the saving grace of his death and resurrection, um, enable me to... Uh, to receive the uh, wonderful um, entry into heaven. The uh, problem with all that, though, is it's very individualistic. And obviously, Jesus wasn't just looking at people as individuals. Our faith is not just individual-focused. Well, here's one person who's saved. There's another person who's not saved. It has to do with transforming society as well and transforming the world so that when we talk about the mission of Christ we're talking about um, really reforming society remaking society that's why we're concerned as Christians about abortion about war about racism about all the social ills that some people would call getting into politics well Jesus in his own way, gave us a vision for this um, and opened our, 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 our eyes to the necessity of these issues. Um, in the, uh, the kingdom of God kind of has a past, present, and future reality. The past of the kingdom of God is rooted in the Old Testament kingdom of David, the ideal kingdom where God was the center of the, or the rule, or the focus uh, for the, the destiny of the kingdom. Well, that kingdom fell apart, but Jesus came to establish the kingdom of God kind of in a spiritual sense, and his death and resurrection overcame the power of Satan. So Jesus not only announced the kingdom of God, but established the kingdom of God in his death and resurrection. Now we might say, well, where is this kingdom? I look around and there's lots of wars and there's a lot of, of, of hatred and, and uh, oppression and racism. All that stuff hasn't gone away. Um, the issue is that Jesus establishes the kingdom and also forms the church. And part of the mission of the church is to uh, be kind of the seed or the yeast of the kingdom of God on earth. As a church, we ought to be able to be a sign of the presence of the kingdom of God. We are a, a community, a society that lives kingdom values. That's why as a church, we really have a high call. We have a high vision that we really have to reach that uh, ideal, in a way, and show that as a community to the world. The early Christians um, made a big difference in the Roman Empire. People looked at them and said, look at how they love one another. And that was transforming for society. That's still the role of the church. The present aspect of the kingdom is we are living in the meantime, in a sense, and the Spirit is present, and what we are called to do is be the kingdom of God. God is present to us, so we're called to live those kingdom values. So the kingdom is past, present, and future when the kingdom of God will be finally established at the second coming of Christ. Some of the issues here, though, is we're always ten tending as a community and as individuals to want my kingdom as opposed to God's kingdom. God's kingdom has to do with surrender, 
conversion. It's kind of like sell everything and buy that pearl of great price. That kind of little comparison of our spiritual life in the kingdom. The pearl of great price is the kingdom of God that we need to totally devote ourselves to in order to transform society. Um, shifting gears here a little bit, um, I want to talk about the church. And it really flows out of the discussion of the kingdom in, in the sense that we, th this is uh, part of our identity as a church, a sign of the presence of the kingdom of God on earth. Now, the church could not be equated to the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God, although it exists in heaven, is not just about heaven. It's about uh, this transformation that's happening on earth, and the church is a big part of that. Um, it answers the question, why do we need a church? I know a lot of people ask that question. Why do I need a church? You know, really, I can go out in the woods and find God a lot better than going to Mass on Sunday. It seems so boring sometimes, and there's babies squalling, and, and I don't like some of those people very much. And um, really, um, we need a church because we need community, for one thing, to grow in faith. We need a sharing of gifts and challenge and um, kind of a mentoring for us to walk the, the walk of faith. And um, even though we don't like to think about it this way, human beings are imitators. Um, you know, I think we, the, the crowd we run with makes a big difference. Um, and if we are imitators, then we need to hang out with people who are on the walk. Because we really, I don't think, for the most part, can do this alone. Uh, for one thing, we share the message as a community, but we also look to one another silently a lot of times and see one another, and just looking at one another's faith helps us along the way. Um, so in, in many ways, you know, Bob Dylan says one of his songs, you're going to serve somebody. And, and I, I mean, I think that's, in a way, for me, why I feel like I need the church. Well, and you know, I'm going to serve somebody. And if I'm going to um, serve somebody, I'm going to kind of end up following somebody's lead. Well, I, I better hang out with people who are going to lead me in a good direction. So that helps me a lot. Um, one of the images of the church in the New Testament that's really strong is the body of Christ. In the, Paul talks about the body of Christ in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and how we really are connected or incorporated into actual Christ's body. So once he rose, his body became a spiritual reality that we could become members of through our baptism. And if we're incorporated into Christ's body, it was more than just being a part of a club like the Lions or the Kiwanis or whatever. This is a spiritual reality that is nourishing, nourishing and uplifting. And it's really being identified with Christ's death and resurrection. Paul talks about when we are baptized, we are baptized into the death and resurrection of Christ. And baptism by immersion really kind of does symbolize this. We go into the waters. We die and rise in a sense. Uh, that's why the church is really going to immersion more uh, to symbolize that dying and rising. But um, really, um, Paul was very literal about this body. In other words, Paul was really assuming and teaching that the only way to really be in touch with Christ the reality of who Christ is, is to be in his body, in the church. If you're not connected to the body, somehow spiritually you're not connected to Christ. So the whole 
uh, image that Jesus gives us of the vine and the branches. I am the vine, you are the branches. You cannot survive alone. You have to stay connected. And so that's what the church is. The church is this body that keeps us in connection to Christ, especially through the sacraments, especially through the Eucharist. We are intimately, even physically, connected to the life of Christ, the life of the church. It's going on within the church. And so um, that's why, as Catholics, we look at this whole aspect of we are the church that stretches through history back to the time of Christ to be so important. You know, we have the four marks of the church. We have, um, and I'm going to do these out of order a little bit because I'm uh, talking about this, but we're apostolic. You know, and I, I think this really does mean something. It's more than just, well, we're the church with the longest history. But in a way, I've heard it said that when I uh, shake hands with a priest who shakes hands with the bishop, who, sh who shakes hands with the pope, it's like I'm shaking hands with the person who touched the person, who touched the person in a succession of people all the way back to someone who touched Christ. So in a way, I'm in touch with Christ physically through this line of succession, this um, kind of passing on of faith and uh, community that's happened throughout the ages. So we are apostolic in the sense that we pass on the apostolic faith. We are successors of the apostles and the disciples. Um, the church is also one. Uh, we are one in the sense that we are united through the Holy Spirit. Um, and the Holy Spirit brings us together. We, we have customs and laws and rules and sacraments and everything, and everybody kind of uh, sees the Catholic Church as being very kind of united or even uniform around the world. We have the same mass structure, even though it's not all the same language anymore around the world. But we are one in the sense that the Holy Spirit resides in the church and brings us together. And some of these unifying factors are demonstrations of that. We are also Catholic. Now, you know, this term Catholic probably isn't understood today in the same way as it was back in the early uh, Christian times. But in the early Christian times, there was a sense that a religion or a cult belonged to a certain nation. There were Egyptian cults, there were Assyrian cults, there were Greek cults, there were Roman cults, and they were all somehow connected to that political entity. Well, what Catholic meant in those days, and I think what still means today, is this is the one universal faith that because of who Jesus Christ is for the whole world, all of humankind, is not a national faith, but a faith that speaks to all cultures. It's a faith that breaks boundaries. We are Catholic, uh, one community for all people. Universal is what the word Catholic means. And we do see ourselves as being um, universal in terms of uh, including and um, being a worldwide church. And last but not least, we are holy. Means, uh, in other words, uh, the Holy Spirit again. Uh, this doesn't mean that we are necessarily all holy people. We're all seeking holiness. But it's the Holy Spirit that brings us uh, to holiness. It's the Holy Spirit within the body of Christ, within the church, that connects us with, with, uh, with God. And the, the grace of the Holy Spirit resides in the church. So we have the means of salvation. We have the grace uh, of God's life and love within the church available to people. Now, I wanted to just kind of do a little comparison here um, between how we looked at church before Vatican II 
and after Vatican II because there was uh, kind of a big change that happened. You know, in Vatican II, uh, in the Vatican the, the Council, the Second Vatican Council happened in the early 1960s, uh, 1962 to 1965. John XXIII was the pope that called the council. He died in 63, and uh, then Paul VI continued it until 65. And it was the first council in really four, uh, well, it was the first council since Vatican I in 1870. So, uh, and, and it really marked a kind of a change in uh, kind of mentality or attitude uh, in the church, but not a change in any of our dogmas or essential doctrines. Um, but it, one of the changes in Vatican II that did happen that really uh, moved us as a church from one place to another was uh, we, we had a different kind of concept of, uh, or we broadened our concept, I guess I should say, of the, what the church was in the world and how we conceived ourselves. In Vatican I, uh, we still had a, a mentality of the church being kind of a fortress. We were the bark of Peter, uh, on the stormy seas of life. It's almost like uh, Noah's Ark. And if you stayed in the church, you were safe. We looked upon ourselves ourself as an institution. Now, all these things about the church are still true, but they were somewhat narrow or, at this time. And the council fathers really thought it would be good to kind of open it up and broaden it somewhat. The institution was looked upon as the reality of what the church was. Um, we were very defensive. We were still kind of defending ourselves from against the Reformation that happened back in the 16th century. Um, we saw ourselves as very unchanging. Authority, the pope and the bishops, the authority of the pope and bishops, and their role to teach, sanctify, and rule was a big part of what we saw ourselves as church, as that was our role in the world, to defend against error, to fight against the evils of the world. We, we saw ourselves as kind of a pyramid form with the pope and the bishops at the top and then priests and clergy and nuns. And the laity were down here. And the laity in many ways, not completely, were there uh, to, in order to get to heaven. In other words, the church was a means of grace. And if you stayed with the church and you obeyed the commandments the church gave us, we would get to heaven. That was much of what we thought about ourselves. With Vatican II, the church was seen more as a mystery. Um, in other words, uh, it was a mysterious, uh, grace-filled community. And it wasn't just kind of this fortress or institution. Uh, it, it was looked upon as the people of God. Before Vatican II, uh, the church was identified, we saw the church as the Roman Catholic Church, and possibly the Orthodox as well. But with Vatican II, we focused a little bit more on what I mentioned before, baptism. All the baptized are in some way members of the church. And it was true that we never celebrated baptism again for Protestants if they were entering the church, if they were validly baptized. There was more of an openness to the world. We weren't so defensive. And openness to other Christian traditions as well. We saw ourselves as more, uh, the mission was to evangelize the, the world, to uh, promote justice, to make a difference in the world. Uh, we also saw ourselves as a little less of an institution and more of a community. The Pope and bishops were seen as servants of the people of God, still with their role as teacher, but we all kind of shared that role. Laity were seen as having a, a, a very specific role in the ministry of the church. We uh, saw ourselves as being um, 
part of the uh, priesthood of Christ, part of the effort to um, make the world a better place, really part of the effort to bring about the kingdom, to help bring about the kingdom, to live a kingdom lifestyle. Uh, with Vatican II, we had the concept of the universal call to holiness. Everybody was called to holiness. In before Vatican II, if you're really going to be holy, you tended to join the upper ranks of the church if you're going to see yourselves as living a real holy life, where uh, in the early, uh, after Vatican II, we saw everybody being called to this holiness in their own way. We saw the church as much more in a circular mentality. In other words, we are a community of faith sharing together as the body of Christ.